Well, good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Brother Eli, I'll have you collect this under squad for the place. So we've been talking about what does it mean to become a Pentecostal powerhouse. And just a heads up, before I forget, next week we're going to start doing our study on the Easter account. And we're going to be looking at it in different ways throughout the next four weeks. We're going to be looking at, can the resurrection and death of Christ be proven historically? Can it be proven scientifically? Can it be proven prophetically? So, come ready for an open discussion at least for, can we prove that Christ really existed, died, and rose from the dead historically, and also prophetically. Next week we'll start out, I believe, looking at it prophetically. But we've been talking about what does it mean to become a Pentecostal powerhouse. And we're looking at it from the aspect of the person that goes to the gym every day, practically, he's lifting weights, he's, weights, he's working out, he's getting lean, mean, tough, and buff. Well, he doesn't happen to get all his muscles overnight, but rather it's consistent effort on practical <coughs> basis. He's consistent in his routines. He can, he's consistent in what he does and how he's progressing. And he measures his progress. The same is true with us spiritually. If we are going to become Pentecostal powerhouses, it's only when we are getting into the Word of God daily. <coughs> we're going to come when we're praying daily, when we're building that relationship with God. It's not a come on Sunday morning or come to church only thing, but rather it's us building our relationship with God. Why is it that way? Because there were many on that day that said, Lord, Lord, have we not done this? Have we not done that? We don't want to fall into that category. We want to be those that have been building a relationship with God. We want to draw in closer to and we've got, looked at many things throughout the past couple months, but we've started looking at the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, who is the baptism of the Holy Ghost for? For the believer. Just one believer, just two believers? Everyone. Everyone. But we're also transitioning into the gifts. Are all the gifts of the Spirit for everyone? It can be. It can be. But does the Bible says that everyone will get all? No, it says so. Can the gifts of the Spirit come to just any believer? Yeah. Huh? So. But what's the prerequisite for the gifts of the Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Now we did mention already that there might be people who pray for people to get healed and they get miraculously healed. Doesn't mean it's one of the gifts of the Spirit, even though the gifts of healing is one spirit. The person who doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost can't pray for somebody to see them completely healed if God works that way. We've also talked about how there were people who cast out demons that weren't saved at all. And if there's any doubt with anything, we can go back to the verse I just quoted. There will be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord. And you'll say, I never knew you. What are these? these are people that did miracles in the name of Christ, but they didn't know Jesus Christ. They did not have him as their personal Savior. We started talking about the gifts of the Spirit. How many gifts of the Spirit are there? Nine. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. And when we look at the gifts of the Spirit, they are broken down by man into three different categories. The revelation gifts, the power gifts, the inspiration gifts. These are just what we classify them under. These three, these gifts, the revelation gifts, are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discernment of spirits. The category that we list as the power gifts are the gifts of faith, gift of healing, and the work of miracles. And finally, the gifts of inspiration are the ones that we're more familiar with. The gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation, and the gift of prophecy. When we look at the gifts of the spirit, we recognize one thing that is true. And it's time and time again throughout the Word of God. What does 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 state? 2 Corinthians 10 and 4.
So the weapons of our warfare are carnal, right? We're fighting a carnal battle, so we need a physical sword, a physical shield. No, they're spiritual, so we need spiritual weapons. And that's exactly what the gifts of the Spirit are. They are spiritual. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through who? Not through you, not through me. Through Jesus, through God, through the Holy Ghost. To the pulling down of strongholds. Because it's not by our own might, it's not by our own spirit, but by His. It's through the Holy Ghost that we see um, chains broken, that we see the, that the gifts of the Spirit actually operate. We are just the willing vessel. And it, once again, we find through the gifts of the Spirit that as for that God demands from us all the time. Submission. Are we willing to submit to God? If we're going to be used in the gifts of the Spirit, we must be willing to submit to Him in every area of our life. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. When we look at the gifts of the Spirit, we've already mentioned that there are nine of them. When we look at the number nine in the Bible, it is the number of divine completeness, completeness, fullness, or finality. If we look at other things that we might find the number nine in the Word of God, we also find the fruits of the Spirit. Nine is the number of divine completeness. So what is the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit? We've already talked about some of these. Uh, Ephesians 4, 12 lists a number of things on why God gave gifts to the church. I know he's talking about apostles, prophets, preachers, teachers, but I believe the same thing thing applies to the gifts of the Spirit. What does Ephesians 4, 12, and 13 say? Now, when I pray, I'd rather pray in tongues. Now, 
I mean, praying in tongues is different than the gift of tongues. We've already established that. But if I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray in tongues. First of all, nobody needs to know what I'm praying about. This is between me and God. Second of all, sometimes there are things I don't need, I need no idea to pray for, and the Holy Ghost is praying through me. Who's that edifying? Myself. But it's meant for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Let me find my notes. It's for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Without going into great detail because we've already covered this. I mean, that's not hard to believe in. When it comes to the notes, all the verses are there. Some other reasons that we might, uh, that the gifts of the Spirit might be in operation. We've looked at persuasion of the unbeliever. We've already saw that in 1 Corinthians 14, 24. Oh, validation of the gospel message. We found in Acts chapter 2 that every man heard them speaking in their own dialect. Now, these men did not know that dialect, but yet there were others in that room that knew it perfectly. And even though the individual speaking it did not know it, the other ones did, and they understood it. What was it? It was the Holy Ghost walking <coughs> through them. Uh, also, I don't think I have it in your notes. Uh, remember that time, uh, when, I think it was a sorcerer came against Paul? And the Holy Ghost struck him with blindness. What is that? The validation of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. If we go to the uh, revival there in Samaria, I think it's Acts chapter 9. We find Simon the sorcerer trying to buy the gift of tongues. <coughs> it was the validation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was real. It was genuine. Uh, we find that it is to guide and direct believers. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 10. If someone will please read that one. Acts 24 um, Acts 21, verse 10. Acts 21, 10. Someone else find Acts 4, 21, 4, 21 and hold that one. Acts 4, 21. So what's Acts chapter 21 and verse 10 state if someone finds that one? Many days are came down from Judea, a certain prophet named Agatha. So we find that the Holy Spirit guided and directed a prophet named Agabus. How about Acts chapter 4, 21? So when they had further threatened them, they, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them. Because the people were all men glorified by the Lord of that which so in Acts chapter 4, 21, can someone tell me what's going on here? I know we didn't go in big detail. Peter and John, Peter and John <coughs> going to the temple, we back up a little bit. There's a lame man there by the gate. And what happens? Silver and gold have thy none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And it was in the temple, and he was in the temple praising God and glorifying God and jumping up and down, and everybody saw it. So what happens from there? Huh? They got arrested. They did good, and they ended up getting arrested. And what do we find here? We find the religious leaders trying to persecute and shut down the work that the disciples are doing. And what did the religious leaders say amongst themselves? <coughs> This kind of could fall into demonstration of the power of God to agree. Mm -hmm. We cannot deny that this man was lame. We cannot <coughs> hide this miracle. We, there is no shadow of a doubt that it is real, it is genuine. So we can only do one thing and one thing only. And what is that? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not I'll show him up in prison, but basically the um, religious leaders said, we can't do anything but try to scare them out of um, preaching in the name of Jesus. 
<laughs> but it did not work. And we find that what happens is that the disciples actually found themselves praising and glorifying God for the mere fact that they were counted and deemed worthy to be persecuted for the name of Jesus. When we look at the gifts of the Spirit, they point praise to God because there is no denying who the miracle came from. It came from God through the power of the Holy Ghost. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3, we find that the Bible states this. But he that prophesied, prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and get this and comfort. There are times that maybe a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge is used, uh, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, all of these can be used to comfort the saints because maybe there's something going on in one's life and no one else really knows about it, but the Holy Ghost speaks forth that don't worry, I'm going to be there in the midst of everything. Um, I'm the tower in which you can run into when the storm is coming against you. Um, I'm the shoulder upon which you can lean when the spirit, of the, when the devil comes in like a flood, the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. And we know that it's meant for us. Sometimes the gifts of the spirit are meant for comforting of the saints. So there are many reasons, uh, many purposes for the gifts of the spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31, there is a phrase that we love to use. If someone would please read 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 31. But covet the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. So many times we talk about coveting the best gifts, coveting the best gifts, which we should. We should desire the gifts of the Spirit. If we, don't have, if we already have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we need to be praying, God, reveal to me the gifts of the Spirit that you've given me. Because we know the Holy Ghost gives to every man severally as he wills. But there are times that I can think of several gifts of the Spirit, unfortunately, that I have not seen used within really much of my lifetime. And you know what? Sometimes, like God, no one else is going to step up. Let me use them. Let, teach me how to use it. Give me this gift. But when we take this passage in context, is the Word of God inspired? Is it the truth? The Word of God is inspired. The Bible is inspired. Oh, expired. Oh, sorry. No, the Word of God is inspired. It's not expired. It's inspired. But are the chapters and the verses, are those numbers inspired by the Word of God? Are they inspired by God? What about the chapter numbers and the verse numbers? Are they inspired by God? separated by man. We had a monk, I can't remember his name, that was nice and divided the books into chapters and verses. And if you've ever read a verse in the Bible and it, or a chapter in the Bible, it seems to have fled into the next chapter a little bit. That is why. Sometimes things go together. When we were talking about the gifts of the Spirit, they actually run from um, chapter 12 all the way through 14, even though they're divided by those numbers 12, 13, and 14. So the verses are not inspired. The verse numbers, chapter numbers. The words are inspired. When Jesus was in the temple and he read of himself and then sat down, he didn't have the book of Isaiah broken by chapter and verse. He had to read through, look through the scroll, scroll to find that passage. It was basically like a giant book with no chapters divided or anything. It was just all written down, one giant letter. So, when we look at covet the best gifts, but what did Paul say in the last phrase, Mom? Yet show I unto you a more excellent way. 
and then we stop. I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And then he sits down. And there was silence in the heavens for about the space of a half an hour, and nobody knew anything else about what the Apostle Paul was talking about in that passage. No, it leads into the next chapter, chapter 13, what we love to classify as the love chapter. Because what was going on in the book of Corinth is, and it's not a big surprise, there were problems in the church of Corinth. We know this. And Paul was writing a book of instruction in 1 Corinthians. And when he was talking about covet the best gifts, what was going on is there was actually contention over some of the gifts of the Spirit. So if I'm being used in prophecy and Brother Eli is being used in the gift of tongues and Brother uh, Peter is being used in interpretation, maybe the moment Brother Eli starts speaking in tongues, I just cut him off and I start prophesying. I was contending. I was fighting. I was in making sure I got in there. Or maybe they were fighting over uh, so-and-so has this gift. God, give me this gift. God, give me this gift. Whatever it was, there was contention. There was fighting. There was strife. And then we get into chapter 13. But I show you a more excellent way. It's great that you have the gifts of the Spirit, but I want to show you something else. If you don't have love, the gifts don't mean anything. You can be used in the gifts of the Spirit, but if you do it without love, you're just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And that's what Paul was getting at here with coveting the best gifts. Because not everyone possesses the same gifts. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 11, all the way through 31. And for the sake of time, we're not going to go ahead and read that. But we find that the Holy Ghost gives to every man severally as he wills. And then Paul goes ahead and lists those gifts. God are without repentance. 
And we also have to remember that God will use whoever is willing and he can speak to. You've already talked to the donkey before. So the gifts of the Spirit are not a sign of salvation. They are a working of God through an individual. But the very first step is, if we are to honestly get the gifts, is to uh, receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Ask for forgiveness of our sins, uh, turn from our wicked ways, stop doing those, uh, those things, and start on the straight and narrow path with God, reading our Bible, developing our relationship with Him. Once we are saved, what's the next thing we want to do? What's the next thing we're looking for? We can seek God, pray. What does Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 state? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. While we're seeking him, then of course the natural thing is we are going to seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When we're seeking to get close to God, we're going to seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Um, can someone get saved and within almost the exact same time period, even the same night, if not minutes, get the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Absolutely. There is no time frame on it. And the Holy Ghost is for everyone who believes. The next thing I have on my list is we need an increase in faith. When it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, they do not operate without faith. Brother, you can feel God moving on you to give uh, tongues, but if you don't have faith and don't let God use and work through you, or if you think it's yourself and you hold your peace, you know, there's a decline in faith, a lacking of faith. Same thing is true. If I feel God's giving me the, something and drops the words right into my spirit for prophecy, and I'm there debating, is this me? Is this God? Is this the devil trying to decipher things? It's a lack of faith. We also got to know from timing. Sometimes God moves on us right away, and sometimes we know we're supposed to hold it for a little bit. And other times, we know that God's wanting to work right then and there, but there's no opening to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. You're waiting for uh, a calm point. But it takes faith, because to be honest, sometimes it takes faith because we know God's given us something, and the Holy Ghost might wane away a little bit. I guess, as we've said before, the Holy Ghost moves on everybody differently. And, and sometimes, sometimes, he moves on that individually differently for the exact same good. But we need to make sure that we are constantly increasing in faith, that we know his works, and that we're ready when he says to go. I remember on um, one church I was at, I felt the Holy Ghost give, uh, hit me and he gave me the words for prophecy. But you know, I couldn't find, there was no break in the service. And I mean, the, there was no break for literally minutes and minutes and minutes. It just went on and on and on. And the Holy Ghost kind of waned back. And then I found a break. And I started prophesying, you know, the Holy Ghost hit me like a ton of bricks. It's a matter of having faith to be used in that gift. Or even those gifts. Next thing is, we need to be willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. If someone would please read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Did it say 1 Corinthians? I meant 1 Peter. 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1 and 2. I don't think you're going to find for anything in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2 about suffering. But what does 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 say? So what did Peter instruct us that as Peter
as Christ suffered in the flesh, so are we to suffer in the flesh for Christ's sake. That's one thing we don't like to do, is suffer. We don't like persecution. I remember in Bible school, um, the one girl came up to me one day and she was talking to me and she goes, Brother Justin, you know what? I was praying that God would give me patience. And I was praying and praying and praying. And all these bad things kept happening to me. I couldn't figure out why. And then I came across this verse in the Bible that said, Tribulation worketh patience. She said, I stopped praying for patience right then and there. But if we're going to get patience, it's only through tribulation. How is our faith going to increase? Through suffering. Suffering increases our faith. Because it forces us to realize our dependency upon God in every situation. And God is looking for people that he can deem trustworthy. If we want to get down to the nitty and gritty, why should God allow us or grant us more gifts of the Spirit or even maybe teach us the gifts of the Spirit if we cannot be trusted with that gift? You don't give anybody something that you can't trust them with. How many people have you ever heard say, well, I'm not letting that out anymore to so-and-so? I'll never get it back. And if I do get it back, it's coming back in a million pieces. And that is if I get it back at all. Even in our own earthly life, how we are living right now, in our everyday life that we live here on earth, in the carnal, in the flesh, we look for people that we can trust. And if we can't trust them, then we make sure to, that, okay, we can't do that with so-and-so, or let so-and-so use that. God is looking for people he can trust too. And if he can't trust us with one gift, why should he give us more? If he can't trust us to develop our relationship with him on a daily basis, why should he give us more? If he can't trust us to simply sit down and read one chapter of the Bible in sincerity and say, God, reveal yourself to me today, why should he give us more? The only way we're really going to increase our faith is through suffering. And why should God take us deeper in the gifts of the Spirit if he can't trust us to go to suffer if need be? Because when we look at the Word of God, where in the Word of God does it tell us that it's going to be all roses and oh, lilies and daily daisies and we're going through fields of nothing but flowers and sunshine on a daily basis? Nowhere. In fact, we get the complete opposite of that. You shall have tribulation ten days. The enemy's going to come in as a roaring lion. You're going to have to fight. Put on the armor. You're going to have to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. How are we going to get the gifts of the Spirit? When we prove that we've accepted to God, that we've accepted Him as our personal Savior. We've turned from our wicked ways. Just because we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us at once and doesn't give us permission to go out and do it all over again the next day or even the next hour, the Word of God is clear that when we do that, we trample the blood of God, of Christ, and we are no different than those that crucified Him. Because we are crucified afresh and anew every single time. We need to seek to get more of God. Seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Make sure that we are reading our Bible, developing our relationship with Him on a daily basis. And not just reading our Bible, but praying and getting to that point of prayer where we are communing with Him and Him with us. We are allowing God to increase our faith. Because from the moment that we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, how many of us can say that He just left us right there and never attempted to draw us any farther to himself, to take us deeper into spiritual things. And if he tried to take us deeper in spiritual things, how did it happen? Was it all roses through the whole time? No. How does he help aid us in building our relationship with him? By allowing tribulation to come our way. Allowing trials to come our way. Why? Because he's, allowed, he's testing. I hate to say he's testing us, but he's looking to see if he can trust us. In those times when 
things get tough and we don't know where to run, where do we run? Is the first place we run is to God or is it to have ourselves a pity party first? Or is it to run out to tell so and so, Brother Peter, man, you won't believe what Brother Eli told me today. He called me a poopy head. <laughs> <laughs> but God is looking for a people he can trust. And if we're going to be used in the gifts of the Spirit, we need to make sure that we are showing God that we are somebody they can depend on and someone who can trust. Because when it comes to this earthly life, yes, it is the Holy Ghost working through us, but he's looking for a willing vessel to go out that he can use whenever he wants. The gifts of the Spirit aren't just to be used within these four walls. They're to be used within the world that we live in. And that is anywhere at any time. It's just we get so comfortable within these four walls. That's where we allow God, and I did say allow God to manifest. I'm sure he'd love to work in public places like Walmart, the gas station. But how many Christians hinder God from moving? How many people does, even those that don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, how many people are God working on them and um, public places say, just go lay your hands on somebody and I will heal them. Just go over there and pray for them. God's looking for people who are obedient and people who are willing, people he can trust. Any thoughts, any questions as we wrap up talking about um, the gifts of the Spirit in general? If not, then we'll bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Um, so next week we'll start uh, talking about the Easter account. Remember, and get ready that we're going to have an open discussion to uh, discuss whether or not we can prove that Christ was who he was, raised from the dead, and resurrected through historical accounts, through prophetic accounts, uh, and scientific accounts. And don't forget to set your clocks back, uh, set them back. Head for next week. Let's have our hands in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we go praise the Lord for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, have his way as he so desires. Anoint our hearts and our minds that they would be proud, that they be good soil for your word to follow on, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives, be transformed to the very image of Jesus Christ. Anoint the pastor as he brings forth your word today. Anoint his mind and his lips to bring forth your words. Anoint the song leader and the, and the, music, and the musicians as they lead us in the songs you have to sing, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Give them a special blessing as well. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.